who will be our presenter today. Dr. Nardell is a pulmonologist with a special interest in tuberculosis. He trained in pulmonary medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital with additional research training at Boston University School of Medicine. While at Boston City Hospital, Dr. Nardell became the director of tuberculosis control for the city of Boston. In 1981, he became chief of pulmonary medicine and director of tuberculosis control for the city of Cambridge, positions that he held until 2005. His principal academic appointment is as associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School with secondary parallel appointments in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard School of Public Health. In the early 1980s, Dr. Nardell was also appointed medical director of tuberculosis control for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, a position that he held for 18 years. Dr. Nardell is currently conducting research project in South Africa, studying the transmission of MDR-TB using large number of guinea pigs to quantify the infectiousness of MDR-TB patients and the effectiveness of various control interventions, including ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. I will now turn you over to Dr. Edward Nardell. Um, so, um, I'm, uh, I work with a lot of engineers and architects, and uh, particularly in developing country settings, and uh, some of what I will be uh, showing you here reflects that work. I won't necessarily attribute every slide to every, um, but we've been giving a course here at Harvard for six years on uh, four architects and engineers, and, and uh, so as a result, we've accumulated a, a fair amount of data that I'll be sharing with you. Um, I want to begin with the fact that hospitals, uh, the problem of, of, of hospitals actually being a cause of disease and not only the place where you go to get better is not new. And uh, I have a quote here from a, uh, a book on British hospitals. And I, I've highlighted one particular line here. Uh, a place of internment of men and disease, its ceremonious but inept architecture multiplying the ills of its interior without preventing their outward diffusion. So um, it was referring to the hospital de Dieu in Paris, uh, uh, which had a mortality rate of one in four persons. So at, at a time in our history, hospitals were a place to go and you, and you died. There is some reason to believe that, uh, in, in some cases, hospitals today are also um, a source of, of illness and death, and um, uh, particularly with regard to TB and multidrug-resistant TB. Now, one of the historical factors that came along in response to that kind of perception was Florence Nightingale uh, in the 1820s, 1910 era, and she was a very uh, uh, proactive nurse who really took control of cleaning up the filth in, in hospitals and making hospital wards really pristine places, as you see in this photograph. She also set the limits of what one nurse at that time, uh, the number of patients they could care for. And you see this schematic, uh, which I'll point to here, uh, down here of, of, of about 30-some beds that one nurse at that time was supposed to be able to care for on these very open uh, wards with high ceilings and big windows. And these we still call nightingale wards. And you know the basic concept has proven to be um, adorable. We still see hospital wards that look like that. In, 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 in more recent times in uh, resource-rich countries, we've come to uh, often have single rooms, and here we have a schematic of two single beds in, in two separate mirror rooms with bathrooms included, and that's all well and good, and, and I think we all like our privacy, and it's certainly good for infection control, but it makes the job of the nurse much, much more difficult to have patients widely separated from each other without direct view, without entering the room, so there are downsides to this uh, uh, more contemporary, desirable, individual room concept for hospitals. Um, 
just a comment on, on buildings and health, and I, I make the statement, and I, I think that tuberculosis is the leading cause of adult deaths uh, globally. Uh, this is arguable with HIV, uh, but you know many, many deaths in HIV, the majority in many cases, are due to TB. So overall, tuberculosis is a huge killer of adults, infectious killer of adults, and buildings play an important role. And so I make the case here that, you know, in terms of buildings, building associated illness, TB may be the most important one. And why is that? Well, you all know that tuberculosis is an airborne infection. So we have an infectious source here uh, depicted by this uh, man coughing or sneezing and generating a cloud of particles, which are made visible by a uh, strobe photograph. These go into the environment, and um, others in that environment. Um, Shown, shown here, um, hosts uh, breathe in that air and become infected. And then, of course, in, in, in many cases, that infection develops back into disease with cavitations, and patients become infectious again. So this uh, airborne route is very critical. And the things that determine whether or not a patient's infectious is how many organisms they generate, the source strength, uh, and how these organisms are diluted or removed. Uh, how resistant the host is, uh, and very, very important, highlighted here in yellow, is treatment, because we'll talk about the diagnosis and treatment that we talked about last time as being the single most important thing to do to prevent transmission. Uh, my own involvement with buildings and tuberculosis began in the early 80s. Uh, depicted here is a homeless shelter uh, in Boston where many uh, Homeless men, some of them alcoholic, gather on cold winter nights and where tuberculosis uh, would spread from person to person. And here you see depicted in the lobby these uh, fixtures uh, being suspended from the wall or hanging from the ceiling, which are ultraviolet fixtures. This is a smoke uh, eater, a way to reduce uh, cigarette smoke. But here we have uh, lights specifically designed to disinfect the air. But we uh, did determined in this uh, outbreak that not only were people being infected, but they were being reinfected with tuberculosis, conditions that resemble what's going on in, uh, in uh, hospitals around the world today and uh, also in uh, many other residential settings. Back in 1985 to 1992, we had a TB resurgence in the United States, particularly in New York City. And it's thought, and I'll show you a quote from uh, uh, our current director of the CDC, suggesting that a great amplifier of these, uh, this tuberculosis was, were homeless shelters, jails, and hospitals. So we have a TB case here who is not diagnosed, or if diagnosed, is not diagnosed as having drug-resistant TB. Treatment starts and is inadequate. Cure rates are low. In the meantime, these individuals find themselves in hospitals and clinics. Some of them have HIV patients in them. And the rate of reactivation, if you have HIV, of course, is 5 to 10 percent per year, as opposed to 5 to 10 percent over a lifetime if you don't have HIV, resulting in a spiral of increasing cases as more and more people enter the system, are not treated, become infectious, end up in institutions where they are transmitting. So in this uh, article in the New England Journal of Medicine, Tom Frieden, who is currently the director of the CDC, uh, attributed the turning the tide, reversing this epidemic in, in, of MDRTB in the United States, to interrupting transmission primarily by better rates of completion of treatment. What I think uh, Dr. Frieden didn't point out uh, here, and we, we didn't emphasize as much then, was even placing people on effective treatment stop transmission right away. It Not only the cures of those patients, but even getting them on treatment was a huge, uh, had a huge effect in, in stopping transmission. Another contributing factor may have been the efforts to reduce the spread of TB in institutional settings, such as hospital shelters and jails. There's a lot of effort made to cut down on transmission in these facilities, but perhaps the most important thing was to get people diagnosed and on therapy. So that was 1980s in and early 90s in the United States. Today, all around the world, 
similar things are happening as the HIV epidemic has spread, as MDR-TB has spread, and so we again can talk about hospitals as uh, drug-resistant TB factories, where under very crowded conditions people are spreading TB from one to another, reinfection is occurring, and uh, patients go into the hospital in some cases without drug-resistant TB and leave the hospital with drug-resistant TB. This was the case in KwaZulu-Natal. I'll show this picture again. We mentioned it the other day. And this outbreak in KwaZulu-Natal, which is uh, in rural uh, South Africa, uh, caught our attention in 2006 when there were 53 XDR patients who were identified and uh, the majority died in very short order. All of these folks were also HIV co-infected, uh, but it was shown by fingerprinting that patients were spreading TB one to another, and of course healthcare workers get caught up, caught up in this as well. So uh, just to reiterate what you all know by now, I know Grigory Velchenkov also did a Russian version of a talk on infection control recently and would have talked about all this as well. We talk about administrative controls, which involve not only triage and separation, but more importantly, or as importantly, early diagnosis and treatment, treatment of TB, treatment of drug-resistant TB. Environmental controls, ventilation, UV, and air filtration. We'll talk all about those. And my next webinar, which is next Tuesday, will focus on upper room UVGI, where we've made considerable progress in recent years. Respiratory protection. Um, both um, uh, for workers and also uh, surgical masks for patients, I'll mention in passing. So we'll again go back to administrative controls, which I talked about last uh, on Tuesday. But uh, in particular, uh, we'll talk about implications for infrastructure. So first of all, is a hospital necessary uh, to treat TB? And the answer is unequivocally no. Uh, many TB patients are treated in the community. And it presents, I think, fewer, patient, fewer problems than trying to keep patients in the hospital with tuberculosis. And for MDR-TB, that seems to be particularly true. Uh, there are an estimated 500,000 new MDR-TB cases per year. And it's very easy to demonstrate all over the world that there are just aren't enough hospital beds to keep people in hospital for even six months for uh, supervised therapy. We need to develop ambulatory ways to treat MDR-TB, and that is happening in many parts of the world. Um, we've been doing it at Partners in Health in Peru since 1996, but it's been uh, done in Cambodia, uh, Lesotho, Cambo uh, uh, Karachi, uh, Pakistan, and in many, many other places, also KwaZulu-Natal. Um, Lima, only about 10% of patients with MDR-TB are hospitalized. Most 90% of them are not. And those are usual for concomitant illness or distance, uh, some um, very good reasons for doing that. Uh, just to demonstrate this data from uh, South Africa by uh, uh, Norbert uh, Nbeki, who directs MDR-TB, showing us that uh, for the uh, nine uh, provinces of South Africa back in 2010, when this was presented, there were estimated 3,000 too few beds. Uh, there was a deficit of 3,000 beds almost for MDR-TB. And with the advent of expert, we're diagnosing more and more MDR-TB, and you can't build beds fast enough. So ambulatory treatment is really uh, essential. Now, I'd like to... Um, talk about hospital structure and the implications of triaging, of administrative controls. And to do that, I'm going back to the oldest Partners in Health site in Kanj, Haiti, on the um, plateau uh, in, um, in central Haiti, where Partners in Health has been running a hospital for 25 years. And they've used a very simple triage strategy. It's not appropriate strategy for for everywhere in the world, but it worked for them in an era when all one had was an, a rapid HIV test and a rapid smear. So patients with tuberculosis mostly were treated in the community, so not using hospital at all. But for those who needed hospitalization uh, because of concomitant illness or because of 
um, distance from the hospital, they were could go in one of three places. They could go to the general ward, they could go to a TB pavilion, or they could go to one of only six isolation rooms which were used for TB patients. To go to the uh, general ward, you had to be smear negative. Uh, we would uh, argue today that uh, the smear status isn't so important if people are on effective therapy. And I've made that case uh, last Tuesday. I'll make it again in a few minutes. And you could be HIV positive or HIV negative because if nobody is smear positive on the ward, presumably there's nobody to infect you if you're HIV positive. So a general uh, medical ward, HIV is po uh, you can be positive. You can have tuberculosis as long as you're smear negative. Uh, I would argue that if you're on effective therapy, that even makes this safer. If you are smear positive in Kaj, they would put you in a special TB pavilion with better ventilation, perforated uh, walls, ultraviolet air disinfection, uh, less crowded, and you had to be HIV negative to be on that ward because you wouldn't want HIV positive patients here with smear positive patients, even on treatment. And then finally, if you were both smear positive and HIV positive, you were a candidate for one of the six isolation, uh, one of the six isolation rooms here uh, shown, and we'll show these in a bit more detail in, in time. So what my point here is that um, although administrative controls are said to be the least expensive and most effective things you can do, uh, they do have structural implications. You have to have places for patients to be, and those patients have to have. Uh, there has to be some rationale for um, the divisions that you make according to patients. And a common one is smear positive and smear negative. I'll make the case shortly that if patients are effective, on effective therapy, that isn't so critical. Now, in a modern era of rapid diagnosis, you can use gene expert, which is more sensitive than smear, and also tells you, one, that this is definitely tuberculosis and not some other mycobacterium. And secondly, that it is drug susceptible or drug resistant tuberculosis by virtue of the rifampin test. Um, so um, this is uh, uh, how we would do things today. Everybody can be treated in the community, but if you're uh, uh, after diagnosis, but if you're MDR TB, you would get different treatment, obviously, than if you're drug susceptible. And if you're XDR TB, these are the patients in particular that need to be in those isolation rooms uh, in, in the modern era. So as I mentioned last time, we call this approach FAST, find cases actively by cough surveillance and by rapid diagnostics. Uh, sputum smear can be a rapid diagnosis, but it doesn't tell you about sensitivity. Uh, active case finding, as I mentioned, cough surveillance separation uh, to reduce uh, exposure temporarily and then effective treatment based on rapid uh, DST. Uh, as I mentioned on Tuesday, all of this uh, FAST strategy, where we focus on the time from entrance in the facility to sputum induction or collection, a time from sputum collection to sending it to the lab, getting the results back, ultimately getting people on therapy, all of this has to happen in, a, in rapid fire. All of this fits under administrative controls and is a, 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 a much more um, focused, uh, structured uh, kind of administrative controls than we've thought about in the past. But clearly the most important thing we can do to stop transmission. Now even FAST, and here is a schematic that we made for the implementation of uh, FAST in Zambia, which is going slower than we had hoped, but nonetheless in one particular hospital, there was one particular ward where all patients who were being admitted coming from casualty or from the OPD would go. And this was the filter ward. And it was the ideal place to screen for cough and to get sputum collected for implementing FAST, looking for unsuspected TB. The point here is that there are structural implications. One has to think about in the hospital if patients are coming from the emergency room or the outpatient department to the hospital. Is there a place they should first go to be assigned beds where screening can occur? And in this particular hospital, we identified this filter ward. In other hospitals, it will be uh, a different uh, solution. Back to Haiti and Kaj, 
This is the general medical ward where patients without um, with severe negative patients could be housed. And I wanted to point out that this is not ideal. We see one relatively small window in the corner. It looks to be closed. A paddle fan, which appears to be off and fairly crowded. So, you know, uh, just having separate places doesn't make those places ideal. And uh, hopefully this has been improved since I took these pictures years ago. Here's the uh, TB pavilion. Again, better ventilation, a UV lamp. Uh, we'll talk more about that next time. And fewer beds. And um, this is a, a better situation for infectious patients. Might be reserved these days for patients with uh, XDRTB who are not on effective therapy. Because once you're on effective therapy, these kinds of precautions aren't needed or certainly aren't needed very long. And then finally, isolation rooms, which uh, uh, might have a UV lamp. We probably have that lamp in the center of the room. This has windows which should be closed, be and there's an exhaust fan, because if you don't, otherwise you may have, uh, 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 you may defeat the negative pressure, which is what uh, this isolation area is supposed to have. Now, in a new hospital in Haiti that Partners in Health built, it's not so new now, but it was a few years ago new, uh, it's called La Colline. Uh, they were much better about having open walkways, uh, uh, doorways that are not, uh, that allowed for natural ventilation, etc. So with some forethought, one can build buildings that are better designed. Again, outdoor corridors are a very good idea, uh, very difficult for air to cross from room to room when you're exposed to the outside. Outdoor waiting areas. This is an, a waiting area at the, a hospital in Haiti, um, although it's sheltered. And here's another area that's going to have vines over it. And outdoor waiting provides uh, ultimate dilution for patients with uh, uh, infectious tuberculosis. Natural ventilation, however, is not a panacea. We've been hearing a lot about it. It's certainly inexpensive uh, to run. Uh, and it's better than mechanical ventilation systems that don't work. Uh, but you can't control the direction of airflow. And what happens at night when oftentimes the windows are closed because it's too cold or for security or to keep out vermin? Um, you know, ventilation during the day only is not adequate for a disease that could as easily transfer, uh, transmit at night as is in the daytime. Here's an example in KwaZulu-Natal. Here's Paul Jensen and Tony Mole doing measurements of ventilation using a CO2 tank. And on this ward, which has lots of windows and a, uh, a ventilation system that they installed, they found that with the windows closed and no ventilation, there was very little air changes per hour, 0.3. Um, with the windows closed but the ventilation on, they got up to 16 air changes per hour, which is pretty good. With the windows open and mixer fans on, however, at that moment, they got 67 air changes per hour, which is terrific, except that the windows won't always be open or the outdoor conditions won't always be ideal to give you very high rates of ventilation. This is a moment in time. But at night, when those windows are closed, you can depend on this mechanical ventilation, or in some cases, ultraviolet air disinfection to achieve the kind of air disinfection you need. If you do depend on uh, natural ventilation, it's important to set up systems to make sure that the windows are kept open. So here is a, a chart from courtesy of Tony Moll from uh, KwaZulu-Natal showing the percentage of windows that are open uh, or closed in each of various wards when, when regular check audits are being done. So you can't leave this to chance. If it's important, there have to be systems in place to see that the windows remain open if they're supposed to be open or uh, can be closed if there are alternative ways of air disinfection on colder days. Now, what is the evidence that building design or ventilation makes a difference? It's really hard to find. The slide I'm showing you was presented at an in international meeting back in 2002, so now over a decade ago, by uh, Roberto Acanelli from uh, Peru and his colleagues. And they showed the annual rate of skin test positivity of medical students 
in Lima, Peru. And you can see that entering medical school, despite BCG, the rates of positive skin tests were very, very low. This is probably boosting due to skin testing. But then you see a continual rise in positivity from somewhere around 20% to somewhere around 60 or 70% um, positive uh, over seven years, particularly in the clinical years where medical students are exposed to patients with tuberculosis in Lima. Now, the, uh, what's interesting here is that students at Cayetano Hospital went to one of two clinical wards for their clinical training. One of them, and they were very different hospitals. Uh, some of them went to uh, Hospital Cayetano, and some went to Hospital Loeza. And the rate of skin test positivity was about twofold different. In, and here in Hospital Loeza, we found 20, 12%, 13% positive skin tests overall for medical students. Whereas in Hospital Cayetano, it was uh, more like 26, almost double the, the rate. And what's interesting, and uh, again, very difficult data to find elsewhere, is that the room volume per bed was about twice as high in Loeza Hospital, the safer hospital, than it was in the more dangerous hospital, Cayetano. And these are very different looking hospitals. And here you see pictures. This is an emergency room. Um, in uh, Cayetano Hospital, small windows closed and a ventilation system that doesn't work well. And here we have Cayetano, a French-style hospital, tall ceilings, uh, open windows, and much greater volume per patient. The greater volume per patient sort of reflects uh, the higher ceilings and uh, imp implies uh, more ventilation, even though we, Dr. Accinelli didn't measure the ventilation bet between these two settings. But nonetheless, it seems to translate to a very different rate of infection for students who become a very good um, uh, measure of uh, infection control. One of the things I need to point out about ventilation from a paper that I wrote quite some years ago, 1991, is that um, the rates of infection are a, a function of ventilation. And it works like this. Uh, this is taken from an actual outbreak in a, an office building where ventilation was about um, 1,000 or so uh, CFM, cubic feet per meter, per person. And we showed that by modeling, if you double that ventilation rate, you could reduce the risk by about half. And but it's difficult to double the ventilation in a building. It's less difficult with natural ventilation and harder to measure or harder to assure. But the point is that doubling ventilation reduces the risk by about half. Now, if, as in this case, there were 27 people who had been infected in an outbreak of TB from one infectious worker, reducing that to 13 uh, would have been good, but not good enough. So if you wanted to go down to six people infected, you'd have to double the ventilation rate again or bring it up to 60 CFM per person, cubic feet per minute per person, which is, again, really challenging to do, certainly by mechanical ventilation, easier by natural ventilation, or even by ultraviolet air disinfection. But the message here is that based on modeling, uh, you, you could predict that doubling ventilation reduces the risk by about half. Now, the other common sense thing is that crowding makes a difference. And just to illustrate this point, I've sort of made this kind of silly cartoon. That if you had 100 people in a room and two of them were infectious with TB and 98 were susceptible, uh, you have a 2% uh, risk. If you take the same 100 people, and divide them up into 10 smaller facilities, 10 smaller wards, 10 smaller buildings, suddenly you have only the infectious case only occurs in two of those buildings, and only nine others are exposed. And it could even be eight others if both happen to be in the same ward. So suddenly, with doing nothing except dividing people up into smaller groups, you've reduce the risk by 80% by
by just dividing people up into smaller groups. The message here is that large congregate settings are not good for airborne infections. Smaller settings are better. And the ultimate, of course, are single rooms, as I started this discussion. But that's an impractical thing in, in, in many parts of the world, and it makes nursing difficult. But smaller is better than bigger in terms of uh, transmission. So you know, we, we see a lot of, and this is a slide that I took with Paul Jensen in um, Botswana. And it was a, a TB hospital that was being renovated to accommodate MDR-TB. And these are the, the infrastructure for the walls that were going to be put up. And they literally put as many walls and as many beds in the space as they possibly could and really uh, made it very overcrowded. So we suggested they really stop this right then and there. And they were going to depend on that, uh, mechanical ventilation and really rethink this because it was not going to turn out to be a, a very safe place for MDR-TB patients. Here's another hospital in Lesotho specifically built for MDR-TB. Again, in Lesotho, it's a partners in health facility. Most of the MDR patients are treated in the, in the, as outpatients. But some of them, need, com, coming from too far away or with medical complications, are hospitalized. And it is a building that is mechanically ventilated. It's not heated or cooled. But it does provide a certain amount of fresh air, has some ultraviolet air disinfection, and uh, is a uh, pretty safe place, we think, for patients to be there. As I mentioned, we've been teaching a course on building design and engineering at Harvard for engineers and architects since uh, 2008. Uh, and our last one was last year. We're not having one this summer, but we hope to have one next year. And um, we uh, think we've trained now about 200 architects and engineers who have a better idea of what a safe building is. And one of the first uh, buildings to come out of that course was by Tariq uh, in, um, in Pakistan. And uh, he designed a building with natural ventilation. And within a year of taking the course, uh, there were um, schematics that looked like this with wind traps and, and, and natural ventilation, waiting rooms outside. And um, this is an actual photograph of the building. These are waiting uh, areas under tent-like structures at the um, Indus Hospital MDR clinic in Karachi. Uh, here you see a better picture of that. These sloping ceilings are to encourage airflow in certain directions. These are waiting areas outside uh, for patients in that very hot, hot climate uh, so that transmission doesn't occur. In contrast, Partners in Health has built a, a large teaching hospital in, in Haiti. And I haven't been there yet, but I'm a bit concerned by the, by when I look at the roof line because it is an awful lot of interior space. And clearly, this is not a building designed for natural ventilation. Probably has some mechanical ventilation and is a, a, a bit of a concern. So you know, even um, in our own organization, we sometimes don't get the message through. We'll, I haven't seen it, so I really don't want to comment. These are solar panels, so there is some power that is being generated by that um, ceiling. But I'm a bit concerned by the interior space in such a building. So um, my first question for you, um, and uh, you'll see this, doubling ventilation rate, or equivalent ventilation rate, if it's uh, UV, is likely to reduce the risk of infection by 20%, not terribly uh, useful, 50%, moderately helpful, or 80%, extremely useful. So we're seeing a consensus of uh, most of the answers are around 50%. Uh, and that's what I told you. I think I mentioned that doubling ventilation reduces the risk of infection by about 50%. Uh, you can keep that as a general rule. But the, the, the follow-up to that is, is if you had a lot of infection and you double the ventilation rate and you reduce it by half, if you want to reduce it again by half, you have to double it again, which is really uh, quite a challenge. Again, just to show you that doubling ventilation reduces risk by half. We're working on this asymptotic curve. 
if the situation is really bad and there's a very little ventilation, doubling in ventilation is easy and the reduce, reduction is dramatic. If ventilation is pretty good, then if you want to reduce that risk by half, you have to really double a very large number. So, uh, but it's a general principle. Doubling ventilation or equivalent ventilation reduces risk by about half. Let's just talk a bit about respiratory protection. I'm not going to go into detail about fit testing or any of that. Uh, but I did want to just talk about respirators. And I took this picture in um, the Sutu of a driver who picked up patients and, and had his or her uh, res disposable respirator handy uh, attached to the shift of the car because used it all the time. And they were really very good about using respirators. In fact, they went even and tried some. Uh, these are called filtering face mask respirators for a better fit. And they're reusable almost forever. Uh, so they found them economically more useful, although they're a bit more cumbersome, make communication more difficult. Uh, but they do can be used over and over and over again. So this is a higher end respirator. This might cost $25, $35. These cost a couple dollars each. And in the long run, of course, these kind of respirators pay for themselves. And again, we won't talk about um, in detail about who should be wearing respirators, about fit testing. Uh, I, I don't have time to do it. Uh, hopefully, there'll be other seminars that get to that. But um, the, the real concern about respirators is that much of the risk for TB transmission is for, from unsuspected cases not from patients who are on therapy or are suspected. So very often, we're wearing masks for patients who are not infectious and not wearing respirators. I shouldn't say masks. Uh, not wearing respirators for patients who are infectious who we, because we don't suspect them. Um, by the way, the distinction between masks and respirators, as you've heard many times, I'm sure, is that respirators are specifically designed to protect the wearer. They have these nose clips to fit better over the bridge of the nose, and usually a couple of uh, good rubber bands that keep the thing uh, tight. Uh, whereas a face mask is just a barrier to stop uh, organisms from leaving an infectious patient or a, someone in the operating room. A very different concept, and they're much cheaper. So I've made this case already, unsuspected, untreated TB. How common is that? I think it's worth dwelling on this for a minute. In a single ward at Hospital Loeza in Lima, for a one-year period, a, a group of researchers in, uh, interviewed and examined 250 of 350, approximately, women who were going on that ward with a variety of problems. It was a general medical ward. And they got a sputum, a chest x-ray, a history, and a physical exam. And they found that 40 patients of that 250 16% had positive cultures for TB. Uh, 55, 65 of those were smear positive. 33% of those, a third of them, were unsuspected. And 20% had MDR-TB, of whom six had, were unsuspected and three were smear positive. The point is here, on any general medical ward in any high burden setting, uh, there are going to be unsuspected, smear positive, sometimes MDR patients or are not on treatment and therefore infectious. And that is the real source of problems, not people who you identify and who you start on therapy, which is the basis for FAST. So again, to just hammer this point in, on a general medical ward, you're going to find untreated, unsuspected TB. It can be drug susceptible. It can be drug resistant. But that is the problem. On a TB ward, where everybody is known to have TB, there is likely to be unsuspected drug resistance. And those patients will remain infectious. Everyone else is being treated effectively with drug, drug susceptible TB. But it's those patients who have unsuspected MDR TB or XDR TB who are going to be infectious. And we need to know about those. And on MDR TB ward, it's the patients with unsuspected XDR TB who are not being adequately treated and who will remain infectious. So hence, again, the rationale for FAST going forward. Uh, cough officers are being used. And this uh, looks at the number of patients screened each month, the number of patients screened each month, the number of sputums by positive by microscopy, 
uh, and um, and people put on dots, etc. And it is a highly effective way in many settings of removing infectious, unsuspected cases from the environment by identifying them and treating them. I don't mean physically removing them, but uh, removing them as sources of transmission. So a little bit on environmental controls. Um, again, uh, we have a facility in near Pretoria, South Africa, where we study these controls. We call it the Air Facility, Airborne Infection Research Facility in Pumbalanga. And we have six patient rooms, and all the air goes to these uh, guinea pig cages where we test the guinea pigs once each month, and we determine whether they're infectious or not. One of the things we're anxious to test is ultraviolet air disinfection. We'll talk more about this on Tuesday. Uh, these are uh, is a fi fixture locally built, uh, and we want to know how effective uh, UV is. So before I tell you, I'd like you to tell me how effective you think UV is. Is it 20% effective? Not very useful. 50% effective? So-so. Or 80% effective? Pretty useful. And uh, wow, I uh, don't have to convince this audience. It looks like you all think it's pretty useful stuff. Well, that's, uh, that's a big sea change because a few years ago, if we uh, talked about UV, people's opinion was that it wasn't very effective. I'm going to show you the data that we got and first show you the experimental design. These are the six patient uh, contributing organisms to the guinea pigs in the chambers. But we have two guinea pig chambers, A and B. And on every other day, the air goes to one chamber or to the other chamber. And every other day, we turn on the UV lights in the ward. So these guinea pigs only, these guinea pigs, like at the arrow, only breathe the air on the days when the UV is on. And these guinea pigs only breathe the air on the days when the UV is off. And the difference between these uh, infection rates over a period of time of months reflect the e effectiveness of the UV in the room. I hope that's clear. So here's the actual data. And the, we had to do this in, in two parts. In the end of the day, there were 48 guinea pigs infected in the control room, that is the days when the UV was off, and only 15 guinea pigs infected in the, on the days when the UV was on. This is an effectiveness of 80%. So those of you, all of you, who assumed it was 80% effective were quite right. Now using the same methodology, we, we asked patients to wear surgical masks. And I'll ask you again. Uh, how effective do you think surgical masks are in preventing transmission? A, a 20%, not very useful. B, 50%, so-so. Or C, 80%, pretty useful. Um, so it uh, looks like we have a majority of thinking that maybe they're about 50% effective. And I guess, again, you've been paying attention to the literature because we have published this. Uh, again, based on the air facility, and here's that actual data. Uh, at the end of the day, in, in that study, we had 69 guinea pigs uh, infected on the days when the patients were wearing surgical masks, and only 36 patients infected. Uh, let me get the arrow. Only 36 percent, uh, 36 patients in, sorry, only 36 guinea pigs infected on the days when the patients were were uh, wearing masks. So a big reduction. It comes out to be 53% protection. Uh, you know, if you believe that this is a, a terrific thing to do, it's not so great. If you breathe, believe they're useless, it's not useless. It's equivalent to what? Doubling ventilation. Doubling ventilation is difficult to do. So simply asking patients to wear a surgical mask uh, when they're uh, as much as they can can reduce risk, but it doesn't reduce risk completely. And it's awfully difficult to ask patients to wear surgical masks all the time. So we don't favor that. Uh, what about room air cleaners? You've all seen these someplace. How effective do you think they are? Not very useful, so-so, or 80% very useful. Wow. Wow. I'm just shocked. Uh, I, Paul Jensen will be really uh, surprised and pleased to see that uh, you folks think that air cleaners aren't very good. And that's what we think as well. Not that they, that in theory, they should be pretty good. 
in practice, they don't seem to be very good. And we did a similar study in the air facility. This is not the uh, air cleaner we used, and I don't mean to uh, disparage this particular uh, company, but I was just looking for a, a picture of an air cleaner. There's a filtration machine here. Here, air is blowing through this. Air is blowing through here, and uh, it's it's disinfecting the air. This is a, from uh, a talk by Grigory Volchenkov, and he tested these against uh, upper room germicidal UV and, and ventilation, and found that the most efficient method was UV air disinfection. Uh, but these were not useful, useless. In our study, we we really didn't get very much effect uh, from them, and we don't understand that. Uh, we, we only found about 20% effectiveness in our own study. Um, we're going to repeat that because we think it should be better. But um, in the meantime, uh, we chose really good air cleaners that should be effective. What we see in practice are these little things attached to walls that don't move very much air at all. So I think if you do remember that room air cleaners generally are not very effective, um, you're, you're, you're on the right track. Um, I'm not saying that that's true across the board, but generally speaking, not the way to go. Uh, this is actually my, uh, I think, my last slide. And it was just to remind you about Global Health Delivery Online. Um, there are discussions on MDR, TB, and HIV. And we have, as many of you know, a, a community of uh, best practice also in, uh, on TB infection control, moderated by Grigory Polchenkov in Russian, uh, myself and Paul Jensen in English. Uh, and um, we do periodically have very good discussions on a lot of topics uh, that we've talked about here today. And I believe that's my last slide. And I'd be happy to take questions. I realize I went over that pretty quickly. OK, so. Uh, Grigory uh, Volchenkov himself asks, hi, Grigory, uh, what is the most reliable test to assess infectiousness? So uh, that's a very important question. And as Grigory knew, we, we were just at WHO discussing how one would determine whether infection control is working. And the best that people have been able to come up with is that you know maybe testing Healthcare workers might be an indicator. I showed you the data from Peru, where medical student conversion rate seemed to be sensitive to the specifications of the hospital they were sent with. Um, so that's one possibility, is testing young people, uh, nursing students, um, uh, medical students. Another is looking at disease rates in healthcare workers. And I, I, I would like to turn the microphone over to Grigory, and I can't. Because uh, Grigory has done some remarkable innovations in Vladimir and has shown a dramatic decline in, in, in TB among uh, healthcare workers in, in his um, uh, TB hospital uh, over the years as he's implemented a range of uh, TB infection controls. So, you know, I think the best thing you can do is um, look at the rates of TB disease. If you have a lot in your healthcare workers, or possibly TB infection in young people if the rates of disease are not high enough to monitor. As I say, having guinea pigs is not a practical uh, option for it. We're not suggesting you, you put guinea pigs. You need hundreds of them. You need a special facility. It's very expensive. We do that for research only. OK. Uh, next question. Many thanks. Uh, I'd like to know, based on experience, at least how long it will take for a smear positive patient placed on effective therapy to become negative? Very good question. And I will refer you to a paper that's going to be published in the Gray Journal in September based on our studies in the air facility, but also backed up by about uh, 60 years of observations among household contacts and also among uh, other studies using guinea pigs. And those studies, particularly Dr. Riley's in Baltimore, suggest that the impact on transmission is much, much, much faster than the impact on smear conversion. We acknowledge that when we use the two-week rule. I, last time I explained where the two-week rule came from. 
was from epidemiologic studies, but the two-week rule says that after two weeks, patients are not infectious if they're responding to therapy. Um, and many patients are still smear positive after two weeks. So we acknowledge that two weeks or the smear is not the only indicator of uh, infectiousness. What I'm telling you is that if someone is on effective therapy, they've got drug susceptible TB, and you have them on four drugs for uh, that are you know INH rifampin, PZA, and ethambutol, you can assume that they've become non-infectious almost immediately, almost immediately. Dr. Riley placed patients on effective therapy at the same time as he was able to measure infectiousness with guinea pigs, and there was a 98% reduction in infectiousness uh, the day they started therapy. Uh, some people don't want to believe this, and I understand that. It, 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 it seems a little hard to believe, but I think it's true. Uh, next question, uh, uh, how long should positive patients be kept in isolation after starting treatment? The traditional answer, if they're drug susceptible or you think they're drug susceptible, is you know, they remain on therapy two weeks. I'm telling you it happens much faster than that, and they don't need to be uh, in isolation at all. If you don't have to hospitalize patients, you don't have to isolate them you know, if they're on effective therapy. But I would get them out of the hospital if you're not going to isolate them. But the, the traditional answer is two weeks. I would say if you know that they, by expert, for example, that they have drug susceptible TB and get them on effective therapy, that you know, uh, if you wanted to isolate them for a day or two, I couldn't argue with that. But really, uh, the treatment is doing the work regardless of smear positivity. That's my belief. It's not what's in the guidelines at the moment. Uh, knee. Um, Hello, Ni. Nee. How long do droplets spend in the air and risk infecting people? That's a different question. Of course, how long they spend in the air is purely a function of how, how, how many air changes there are. Um, with one air change, you've if it's perfectly mixed, which is a big assumption, you remove 63% of the air in the room. One air change. If you have two air changes per hour, you've removed 84% of the air in that room. If you have five air changes per hour, you've removed 99% of the air in the room. Uh, you often don't know how many air changes per hour you have. Now, at the same time, they're being generated, of course, and, and there's a, you know, a balance between the rate they're generated and the rate they are disappearing. The uh, other uh, issue is how viable are organisms in the air. And we have only two studies that were done under controlled conditions uh, published that address the point of how long organisms remain infectious in still air. So this is a rotating drum. The air is not going anywhere. It's humidified. It's uh, warm. And one study showed that they could stay there um, for uh, six or seven hours. At, at the half time was six or seven hours. So you know there would be still organisms there 10 hours later. Another study showed 20 minutes half time. I'm not sure which to believe. Um, I think it's hard to keep organisms alive if they're not. So I presume that under some circumstances, they can stick around for a long time. But the real answer is that even with one air change, which is not very much ventilation, 63% of the organisms are gone. So the fact that they may remain infectious is uh, secondary to the fact that they are likely to be gone. Uh, is there a study that combines wearing masks for both patient and healthcare worker? I'm not aware of one. Uh, however, a properly fitted respirator is much more effective than 50%. In theory, probably more than 80 or 90% effective. And, and it's ineffectiveness has to do with face seal leak, not the filtration material. So you always get a little bit of leakage around the face mask, and that accounts for the fact that no thing is perfect. But you'd expect that if both parties were wearing it, that the protection for the healthcare worker would be greater yet. But we know that people can't wear surgical masks all the time, the patients, and that even if you ask them to wear them almost all the time, they're probably not going to be any more than 50% effective. 
I'm wondering uh, how drafty a space with 67 air changes without, uh, without UV assistance would feel in terms of being comfortable or not. Well, it depends on how well that uh, building is ventilated. I mean, all of us on a warm day don't mind a nice breeze uh, going from one window to another, and it's quite comfortable. On a cold winter day, that same breeze would feel intolerable. So temperature matters, uh, whether, whether it's very forceful. You can get the same 67 air changes through one duct, and it will feel like a torrent. If it's coming in through 12 windows, it may not be very noticeable. So it all depends on how it's done. But that's an awful lot of ventilation. And uh, it could be uncomfortable. You're absolutely right. Or it could be, feel wonderful uh, in a very hot ward. Uh, thank you for the presentation. We'd suggest measurements for air changes per hour to assess ventilation. All ward facility uh, that has been high burden of TB. Uh, well, um, yes, when we teach the course uh, and we go to the ward to look, uh, we, we, give, we give our engineers and architects a simple device called a vanometer, V-A-N-E-O-M-E-T-E-R, which is a simple way to measure airflow. And from that, if you go to the windows and the doors, you can make some measurements with direction and flow that you can get some rough estimate of how much air of changes there are, but it really is a rough estimate. And very often, if you take a smokestick or even a incense or... Uh, whatever, you'll see that the wind goes in and it goes out again and it goes back and forth. And it's really hard to know how many air changes there are. You can use uh, CO2 dilution as Rod Escom has done. It's tricky. It's not routinely done. And it tells you about the air changes at that particular moment. So it looks like we're out of questions and we are out of time. Um, and so I thank you for really a very vibrant discussion. And, uh, and if you want to email me any other questions, I know that uh, Evgenia is going to tell you that. But uh, I'm happy to address them. Or even better, put them on GHD online so everybody can benefit. Thank you. Um, I'd like to sincerely thank you, Dr. Nardell, and of course, our wonderful participants for great questions and your availability today. And as mentioned, you will be able to view the recording of this webinar later, as well as download the related materials on the DRTB Training Network website. Uh, and uh, our next webinar in the Infection Control 